Um, good afternoon and welcome to the HSE press briefing. Firstly, can I apologise for the absence of Irish Sign Language interpreters at the moment, but hopefully um, during the press briefing um, that will be put right. Could I first ask the um, speakers to introduce themselves from the left? Uh, Damien McCallion, HSE National Lead for the Vaccination Programme. Eve O'Byrne, National Lead for Testing and Tracing. Anne O'Connor, Chief Operations Officer. Paul Reid, CEO. And I am Mark Brennock, National Director of Communications. Um, this briefing is being broadcast on the RTE News Channel and on the HSE Twitter feed. Uh, could I ask Paul first to give us an update? Thanks, Mark, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, the past few months have, and the success of the vaccination programme and the uptake here in Ireland has given us all a clear demonstration uh, of the rationale and the need to go ahead and plan uh, for the, uh, to move towards the, the rest of our lives and the way we should be living it. Uh, but equally so, uh, the past few weeks have kind of re-baselined us all uh, that if we do ignore the basic levels of uh, protection, we ignore them at our peril. Uh, we have higher levels of protection because we are, as if we are vaccinated, uh, we, we always have to remind ourselves we're still living with a highly infectious disease, COVID-19. Uh, as a society, we all know we're not where we had hoped we would be at this stage of this week. And nobody, least of all our healthcare workers, uh, want to be here back in this place again. But we should also equally balance that by saying we are here uh, with a different level of protection, which is the very significant uptake of the vaccination programme. Uh, but what we do need now is for all of us to, I guess, immediately reboot uh, some of the basic levels of protection that have served us well uh, for so long. Uh, but this I particularly mean the public health measures. Uh, just to reflect briefly on this week and government decisions uh, overall, uh, they were set out, as you know, earlier on during the week in relation to the current phase and next phase. Uh, we in the HSA are currently finalising uh, two particular tasks uh, that have been allocated to us arising from the government decisions this week. Uh, firstly, we will begin uh, within a couple of weeks uh, or less on the administration of the booster vaccines to more than 800,000 of the population, uh, those people aged uh, between the ages of 60 to 80. And uh, my colleague Damien McCallion will uh, talk to some of that just later on. And we'll also work to ensure that planned increased use of antigen tests as set out by government for asymptomatic close contacts of confirmed cases is put into action. And again, my colleague, Ms. Neva Byrne, uh, will give some details on that process and how that will work and the timelines for implementation. I do also think there is a need to put things in a little bit of perspective uh, also uh, throughout this week. Uh, very conscious that much of the coverage and much of the concern and uh, issues to be clarified related to uh, the application of the decisions to one level of sector or one level of a location versus another. Uh, and there been must, much discussion uh, whether it's fair that one sector, one location can operate one way and another has to op operate another way. And I fully understand and the importance of that for those sectors involved. But it's equally important not to lose sight of the big picture. And from a health perspective, I do want to outline the serious impact that we are seeing in our hospitals and our healthcare system uh, in general overall over the past few weeks. And the big picture does show uh, that the health of some people remains under serious threat uh, because of the levels of transmission of the virus. We are getting to increasing levels of risk every day and every hour, indeed, in our hospital system in particular. We're seeing very many uh, patients with COVID in our hospitals every day, and indeed many more every day. In some cases, uh, unfortunately, there are still people dying with this disease. Also, there are people who have already been waiting far too long uh, for important medical care, non-COVID medical care. And what we're trying to avoid is a very real risk now that with the amount of COVID-related illness uh, potentially mean that they will, people waiting for the care could be waiting even longer uh, because our hospitals are so under pressure now in terms of managing the volume of patients with COVID uh, and having to make difficult decisions around scheduled care to cope with that volume. So from my perspective today, there's three key messages that I particularly wanted to share uh, and, and as follows. Firstly, 
uh, we are in a much strengthened level of protection with this vaccination than we have been for any other waves. Uh, but we do all need now to uh, strengthen our personal level of awareness uh, and risks uh, and enhance our defences against the virus. Secondly, uh, the risk profile of our hospitals has radically increased over the past two to three weeks in particular. And thirdly, just a particular call to those who are unvaccinated. You are, no doubt, putting yourself, your family and your friends and indeed other people in society at an unnecessary higher level of risk. And indeed, in the interest of the wider common good, uh, we would urge you uh, to come forward, seek clarity on any issues that you do need to seek clarity on uh, and come forward for vaccination. We have many vaccination clinics all across the country available if you register and come forward. The flood of measures that have been working against us in particular has been well reported on throughout this week, but just when you put a range of them together, it gives you context on what we're facing in the hospitals in particular. Uh, so we are dealing with higher levels of cases uh, throughout the past few weeks in particular, and indeed on a daily basis now seeing uh, over 2,000 cases, and most likely uh, with the trends that we're seeing, we'll most likely see over 2,000 cases, well over 2,000 cases again today. Uh, positivity rising at quite concerning levels across the country, and particular in certain pockets of the country. Uh, more people are testing positive and more people are symptomatic. Uh, we are seeing and have seen a very significant shift in the age and the average age of those testing positive with COVID, uh, moving from about 27, uh, 24 to just about 34 now. Uh, and more, so more older people are getting sicker. Uh, more, peace, more people are being hospitalised and indeed more people uh, literally by the day are being put into ICU. Uh, we are dealing with higher volumes in our emergency departments separate to COVID uh, and, uh, throughout the past few weeks in particular. And we've also seen early identification of the flu virus, which would cause us concern as we head into winter. And again, a call to those people uh, to come forward for the flu vaccine who are eligible for the flu vaccine. We're all seeing a prominence of respiratory illness, uh, early indications of RSV in children, uh, which is uh, an, an early indication of what the winter season will like, be like, but also very real impacts on our children's hospitals in particular. Uh, and as you've seen reported during the week, uh, prominence of the norovirus, uh, which again, usually leads to people attending uh, to our emergency departments. So all of those flood, I guess, of negative measures are impacting on our hospital and healthcare services Specifically related to virus uh, and the trends. Again, my colleague Neva Byrne will give some details on this. Uh, but we are seeing rises, as I mentioned, across uh, all age groups over the past week. The biggest increases amongst the older people, 65 to 74, up 35 percent, and the over 85s, up 33 percent. The lowest rising among those 13 to 18s, but still up 11 percent, and 19 to 24 year olds, up 13 percent. Just to give you a very brief flavour of what's happening in our hospitals and who is being admitted to our hospitals. Uh, we've now, as of lunchtime, uh, 448 people in hospital. It was 468 this morning, uh, up about 12% on last week. Um, again, thankfully down on a number of 486, uh, as it was yesterday morning. Uh, today, right now, there are 88 people in ICU, which we know has been a very significant rise over the past 24, 36 hours, uh, up about 27% on this day last week. Over the, four, over the past 14 days, there's been 536 people being hospitalised, 28 have been admitted to ICU. Of the 536, just to give you a perspective on ages, etc., uh, about 7% were in the age group of six, 0 to 18 and two of those admitted to ICU. About 12.5% in the age group of 19 to 34, two admissions to ICU. About 30% in the age group 35 to 64, and 13 admissions to ICU in this age group. And about 49% were in the age category 65 and over, 11 ICU admissions in that group. Uh, some detail just on vaccination status in hospital, uh, literally uh, as of this week. 65% um, uh, of those people in hospital are fully vaccinated, 27% not vaccinated, uh, 
and there's about 7%, which we just hadn't fully identified, still a very disproportionate number of people unvaccinated in hospital. And in ICU and vaccination, uh, just to figure some earlier this week as well, 41% uh, of people in ICU are fully vaccinated, 52% are not vaccinated, and 5% partially vaccinated. A very significant disproportionate uh, impact on those who are not vaccinated in the population uh, entering into ICU. Just on ICU in general, just to make a few commentaries, um, there's been understandable reporting and commentary on ICU beds uh, available at any given point in time, which is obviously something that our intensivists and our consultants uh, monitor very closely. Uh, but there is a wider message uh, that I'd like to relate to the public is that we don't want to see this significant numbers in ICU at all. Um, you know, 88 people in ICU is taking up over 30% of our total ICU capacity. All real people with families, who most likely were not sick uh, related uh, until contracted a virus. And we must always remain conscious of that. Um, and the level of projections, as you will have seen communicated from the NEFIT earlier this week, uh, have caused considerable levels of concern, particularly to our ICU consultants, uh, if we were to see those levels of merging of approximately 150 people in the next few weeks uh, in ICU. Um, and I think as Dr. Colin Lachlan said during the week, uh, we do initiate and activate surge capacity at a national level and a local level, uh, but we should not give the impression that that's a, a lineup of nurses or doctors ready and waiting to just go in. It usually means redeploying from what a key core activity we have in hospitals, closing other wards, and a general knock-on impact in terms of our emergency department and capacity to admit people. So surge is not a pleasant uh, place that we all want to avoid and don't want to get to. Um, and we do know equally as we head into, we are only in October, as we head into uh, some of the peak elements of the season and winter. Uh, so I do call for the public support in terms of those public health measures. They do make a big difference uh, to us and our health and our health and hospital system. Uh, very briefly, just want to reference the issue around maternity and hospitalizations as well. Uh, from the 27th of June to the 2nd of October, there were 12 cases of pregnant women with COVID-19 at, uh, at with COVID-19 at the time of forced admission to ICU in that period. 11 of the pregnancy cases uh, reported of not having received the vaccine. So it is, and one case had reported having one dose. It is, again, a call to uh, pregnant women to seek consultation uh, or seek advice and seek information uh, from their health practitioner. And just overall and conscious uh, also that the issue of partner supports and visits has been the subject of much concern amongst uh, pregnant women, the HSE remains committed uh, to supporting this to a great extent while also maintaining the safety of uh, preg pregnant women and their babies. Uh, the concern remains high based on the current transmission levels, but also in terms of admissions to ICU of pregnant women, as I've just outlined. Uh, that, mean, that being said, um, we do remain committed to facilitating nominated support partner access and visits. Um, following very constructive meetings with the advocacy groups and campaigners uh, for young women, young moms, uh, pregnant women. The HSC has looked at the recent experience of two maternity hospitals in particular, who have moved forward giving greater access to nominated support partners uh, in all inpatient areas, including uh, multi-bedrooms. Uh, our analysis and our judgment and findings working with those hospitals were that patients, partners, and staff worked very well together uh, to make this work. The hospital's taken the approach have not seen, the hospitals who took this approach have not seen any evidence of spread and, and infection. And it's because of this, we're very pleased uh, to have uh, announced earlier on, um, to inform and uh, move to a more safe uh, decision-making process to allow further access. So from the 1st of November, all maternity services can provide access for nominated support partners to access inpatient areas during normal visiting hours of 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. I particularly would like to thank on behalf of the HSE, um, uh, the women and their partners for their support and patience in working with us through this difficult and challenging time, and we will continue to engage those advocates. Uh, just in closing, can I very briefly say, because I may not get a chance to say uh, at the end of this, uh, just a few words of thanks 
uh, to my colleagues here today, Ms. Neve O'Byrne. Uh, tomorrow is, is Neve's last day with us in the HSE. Uh, I did approach um, Neve and her organisation, EY, uh, back in April of 2020 and sought the support of Neve because we need extra support in at that particular time uh, and expertise and did commit that it should be for about three months. Uh, that was over 18 months uh, ago. So Neve is returning to her power to continue her career there. But I want to thank Neve for everything she's done and uh, progressing the testing and tracing processes and organization. And uh, she's left a great mark in the HSE and the health system. So thanks. I'm going to pass across to my colleague, Anne O'Connor. Good afternoon. Um, right, we're going to talk through the position across our hospitals and uh, services in general. Uh, and it's been a while since we've done this, so the data has moved on a bit. So when we look at the annual attendances, we can see there that we're up at 25,580 in the past week, which is higher now than 2019 or 2020. So the 2020 line there obviously was slightly Im impacted by the outbreaks last year, uh, which is the darker line. But even by 2019 standards, we are above that. Uh, on an annual basis. When we look at how that translates into admissions, we can see that it spiked quite a bit last week. Okay. Uh, so uh, it spiked a bit last week, so just go back and show them. And uh, that's the attendances there um, and admissions here. So we had a lot of admissions last week, again, significantly higher than 2019 and running slightly above um, 2020. But when we look at what that means in terms of the past eight weeks, uh, we can see that it's only up marginally on last week. So our overall attendance is up only 0.2%, uh, but that is 24% higher than last year. Uh, our admissions then uh, down 3.7 on the previous week. And again, week on week, you know, we don't really look at that too much. Uh, it's the overall trend and our admissions overall are up 8.1%. Now, what I would say is that these national figures mask a significant regional variation uh, in some of this data. Uh, when we look at the over 75s, we can see a different story in terms of just a significant difference really uh, for some time now in terms of the rate of attendances of over 75s. Uh, this has been a theme last year and this year, but we can see that particularly so this year uh, and in the last week down slightly. Um, admissions running, you know, higher, uh, but not hugely different. Um, so when we look at the last eight weeks, we can see that the attendance has actually came down just under 6% on last week, but up 15%. Again, important to point out that when we're talking about older people, uh, they are more likely, so when they attend an emergency department, they're more likely to be admitted. And when they are admitted, they are more likely to stay longer. Uh, so generally people have different comorbidities when they're older, that leads to a longer length of stay. Um, and the admissions, when we look at those for over 75s, down 8.4% on last week. Last week was very high, actually. Uh, and that's 3.2% on the same week last year. Um, so in terms of, of the length of time, so an important measure for us, we spend a lot of time talking about trolleys, but actually the important measure is how long people spend in our emergency departments. And that is our patient experience time. So everybody uh, is captured in our 24-hour patient experience time. Nobody, nobody should be waiting over 24 hours. Um, but we are seeing that 96.4% of all people attending last week were discharged uh, or admitted within the 24 hours. And the nine hours uh, relates to over 75. So we can see that 55.6% uh, of people were discharged or admitted uh, within nine hours. And that, you know, is something that we are working to improve. We're acutely aware of the need for people, particularly older people, to be treated as quickly as possible in our emergency departments. Uh, and these are for the people, you know, many of these will have been discharged home. They're not all admitted. Our trolley count is, continues to be higher than it was last year. It's not as high as it was in 2019. Uh, clearly in the COVID environment, uh, we don't want too many people on trolleys. Uh, we have adjusted and amended many of our emergency departments in terms of having individual spaces for people. But in terms of managing infection prevention and control, it is really important to us that we have people, uh, I suppose, a reduced number. So our number actually has come down uh, in the last, you know, today, in the last couple of days. But again, this national figure does mask some significant challenges in certain sites. And these are the sites. Now, interestingly, today, when we look to the data, it doesn't look too bad. Uh, it's still not great, uh, but we can see the sites. So in reality, 
the West and the South are particularly challenged in unscheduled care. Uh, so when we look at Galway this morning, we had 37 people on trolleys. Trolleys are for people who are deemed to be admitted. Uh, so these are people who have been assessed and are awaiting a bed in the hospital. Um, so 37 people this morning. Yesterday, that was up at 54. Uh, Galway have experienced very high levels of attendances and also very high levels of admission. In some of our sites, we're seeing high levels of attendance, but those people are not all being admitted. Uh, but Galway, Limerick today, interestingly, six on trolleys, they have had very high numbers. Uh, Cork University Hospital has been very challenged in terms of attendances. Uh, this morning, 29, uh, Sligo, 10, The Matter, 15, and Mayo, 21. So those numbers actually are much better than they were any other day. They must have known there was a immediate briefing happening, uh, but they are better than any other day this week. Uh, in terms of just the challenge that has been faced in some of our big sites. Uh, and again, significantly uh, high numbers of older people. So over 75s, a real feature of our attendances. Our delayed transfers of care, that break in the red line there relates to the cyber attack where we had no data available. 483, so it's up 3% on the previous week, up 16% on last year, but down considerably on 2019. Uh, so 31% down. And again, very important for us to maintain patient flow throughout our sites. Uh, you know, when we have people who are deemed fit for discharge medically, we try and support them to go home or to move to other step down beds so that we create capacity for those people who are in emergency departments in need of beds. Hospitalised cases, 448. And again, this is the data from earlier this morning. Uh, increase in Paul went through some of this. Uh, our COVID admissions, we had 40, uh, 35 yesterday, or the day before yesterday. Sorry, 30 today, today's the 21st, so 30 today, 35 yesterday. Uh, so again, significant numbers of people being admitted with COVID. Uh, and then we can look at the percentages and poll references too in terms of the numbers vaccinated. So the big line, that the, the higher line there is the total number of COVID cases on site um, and the total confirmed is the light green there in the last 24 hours and the red reflects those who are fully vaccinated. Um, so we can see again significant numbers being admitted uh, and this is having an impact in terms of our sites and again just to emphasise within our acute sites we are running COVID and non-COVID pathways so we are continuing that dual process in all of our emergency departments. People who are considered to have any symptoms that could be indicative of COVID are streamed through the COVID pathway and anybody who has attended an emergency department in the last year or so will be aware that people are assessed uh, when they arrive to determine which pathway they should go down. ICU admissions, uh, 14 yesterday, uh, two up to earlier this morning. Uh, and the age profile Paul referenced, so significant number there aged over 50, um, with one under 18 and the rest 19 to 49. Vaccination status, we can see that as of yesterday, 45 were uh, not vaccinated within the ICUs, 35 were fully vaccinated and there were five partially vaccinated. Just in terms of our ambulance activity, again, this is always a very good indicator in terms of how busy our system is. Uh, the graph on the left there, sorry, they're a bit small, but the graph on the left refers to our AS1 calls. So these would be the trauma cases, cardiac events, serious cases. So a lot of activity in terms of that, that accounts for about a third of the activity uh, in terms of the higher end. Uh, but the graph on the right is interesting because that graph has gone way over and above the predictions in terms of people being transported to hospital. Uh, so these are the conveyances of people by ambulance to emergency departments. Uh, and that is running significantly higher than where, where we would expect it to be or indeed where it was last year. Uh, so our ambulance service is also under immense pressure uh, in terms of responding to calls. And that is something that, again, you know, we are seeing some delays in our ambulance services uh, and many people arriving now in hospital by ambulance. Just in terms of uh, waiting lists, um, want to come back there in terms of the outpatient list, again, the break refers to the cyber attack. Uh, so this is our waiting list up to September 2021, so 2019 to September 2021. And you can see there uh, the light green line was 2019, dark green 2020 and the red is this year. So running significantly higher. Uh, and this is something that we have talked about before in terms of the impact and as Paul said, the, on the other work. So by having high levels of unscheduled care, higher levels of COVID, it does impact. Uh, we have, however, seen that start to reduce in terms of work that's gone on in the last six weeks. Uh, we reached a peak there a few weeks ago, about 655,219. That is now down to 646,438. Important to point out that when we're managing waiting lists, the first thing is to not add to the list. So actually managing what's coming through the door and then working to reduce the backlog is the challenge for us. And our outpatient numbers 
are huge in terms of a very big mountain to climb, uh, but at least it is now going in the right direction. And we want to be able to continue that. So we want to be able to continue to do that important work for people. Likewise, in terms of our inpatient day and day case, this is an interesting one in that we saw that list grow considerably last year. So back in April, March of 2020, there was a significant climb in the numbers waiting for inpatient day case. That came down throughout the year we started. The red line there at the beginning of this year, a bit higher than where we ended last year. But we are now running lower than where we were last year. So a lot of work going on in terms of managing the inpatient and day case list. Uh, in terms of numbers, the highest we got there in the last six weeks was up to 75,500 uh, and we're now down to 74,386. And again, these are still big numbers, uh, but it is going in the right direction and the number is coming down. The third category we look at there is our scopes. Uh, scopes were hugely impacted by both the COVID surges that we had in the last year, but equally the cyber attacks. So we had some of our sites were very significantly impacted by the cyber attack in terms of their ability to do scopes. Uh, and again, we have seen that now start to reduce in the last, uh, you know, in the last while um, in terms of actually the activity returning, again, very impacted by outbreaks. Uh, but the numbers have come down. So we're down, the highest we got to there was uh, 32, about 32,500. We're down now to 31,100. So not a massive reduction, but we have stopped growing and we have turned the curve. And again, to emphasize, we really want to try and keep that uh, in the downward trajectory because we are very, very conscious that we have many people out there whose care have, has been deferred by virtue of the surges, also by virtue of the cyber attack. Uh, and that's very important to work on for anybody who's awaiting an appointment or who's had an appointment canceled two or three times, it is a very difficult position to be in. Uh, so again, our capacity in hospitals is really needed to continue that work. Just in terms to mention a few other things, um, we're still continuing to avail of private capacity. So at the minute, we're still using about 1,100 bed days per week under the safety net agreement. The NTPF is also accessing private capacity in terms of addressing some of those waiting lists that we mentioned. Uh, we have a significant number. So in terms of staff, we have 1,823 staff currently out on COVID-related absence. So that would be people who are um, either close contacts or testing positive. So again, quite a significant number. Um, and we continue to have outbreaks. So at the minute, in terms of our long-term residential care facilities, including nursing homes, we have 154 open outbreaks across these facilities, uh, 62 nursing homes with outbreaks, which is about 10.9% of nursing homes. Uh, now, it is the case that the numbers impacted by outbreaks are much smaller, um, so smaller numbers, but still averaging about 11.6 cases per outbreak. Uh, and clearly, uh, we are now going around the nursing homes in terms of the booster programme that, that we'll talk about. Uh, in terms of our hospitals, as of the 10th of October, the week ending the 10th of October, we had 35 hospital outbreaks. We don't have the following week's data yet. Um, and 53 hospital acquired cases uh, with 162 acute hospital staff testing positive. Uh, we also had our first case of the flu um, in that week. Uh, interesting, when you look at the data, the pressure on our paediatric services is immense. And again, anybody who's attended any of our uh, either the Dublin Paediatric Hospitals or other paediatric services will know that they're exceptionally busy. Very high attendance is related to RSV, not COVID. Um, and again, that's putting very significant pressure on our services. Um, so just then in terms of uh, really what we're talking about, there's a few things and Paul has referenced some of this. We're asking everybody in the interest of our whole healthcare system. So if not for yourself, but also for the broader healthcare system and for people you know who might need to access our healthcare services over the coming months. We are now under significant pressure and we are asking people to please do what you can to protect these services, to protect them for yourself in the event that you become ill or to protect them from people you know. So follow the guidance, the public health guidance in respect of COVID-19. Get vaccinated. If you are not vaccinated, please get vaccinated. Um, adhere to, I suppose, the test and trace regime that Neve will talk about in terms of being tested um, when required and if, you're, if you feel the need to be tested or in, in line with the guidance. Um, uh, we've put flu vaccination in as well because we've now also started our flu vaccination program. This started in October and we are encouraging all eligible people to be vaccinated. This vaccine is now available in GPs, uh, through GPs and in pharmacies. And keep yourself well. Uh, so we are now starting the winter messaging around staying well. One of the very important things you can do for yourself this winter is to try not to get sick uh, in terms of maintaining your health. So where you are healthy, please 
try and keep yourself that way, uh, which sounds very simple. And we know it's not that simple for everybody. But the reality is we want to support people and our services are very much about trying to keep people at home this winter. We want to reduce the number of people coming into our hospitals and we want support to support people to go home from hospitals uh, as quickly as possible. In terms of information, we continue to have updated information on our HSE services in terms of our HSE website. Um, again, uh, attending services, please, you know, if you, if you want to find out more, please contact the websites. A lot of our hospitals actually have their own websites um, and that probably is a little bit outdated in terms of the cyber attack. Just in conclusion, I want to really acknowledge the work that is going on around our health system. Um, Paul referenced just the, I suppose, the, the work that is going on as well. Our staff have been working tirelessly and continue to do so. And for anybody who has been in around any of our acute hospitals recently, you will see how hard our staff are working to continue to provide services in a very difficult situation. So very crowded emergency departments, under pressure, um, and working sometimes with people who are vaccinated, sometimes with people who aren't vaccinated. Uh, but I just want to thank all of our staff for all that you do day in, day out, uh, and all of the things that you will continue to do as we head into what will probably be a difficult winter in our health services. And again, just to emphasize that message to people to do all you can, please, to support us to be able to deliver services to everybody. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'll give you a few minutes on uh, testing and tracing. Um, so as my colleagues have referenced, it's been um, a busy few weeks um, for testing and tracing. Um, as you can see here, having covered over 154,000 um, swabs um, going through our labs in the last um, week. We have been busy both in the community side, but also in the acute system in the volume of testing um, that has been um, going on. And uh, so if you look here, you can see in the graph uh, what's been happening over the last few weeks. Uh, we were on a decline uh, and then two weeks ago that turned around and we started to see um, the number of people coming forward for testing start to increase. So just in the last week alone, we've seen an 18 percent increase in those coming forward uh, for testing. On top of um, that increase, we also have a higher number um, in terms of overall um, positivity. So positivity in the community testing sites is currently sitting at 11.8%. And if we look there two weeks ago, uh, it would have been at 8.8 uh, and even further back um, uh, five weeks ago at 6.8. Uh, so this has risen um, quite uh, significantly and in some counties uh, in the country, it does exceed 19%. Now, when you blend it overall uh, with the acute hospital testing, uh, which is a lot of asymptomatic testing in those settings, um, we have an overall positivity rate now of 9.6 uh, in the country. Certainly what we've noticed in the last week is that there has been increase across all ages. So as we know, the case levels have increased across all the ages, but so have the um, referrals um, for testing. The highest um, number of referrals comes from the 35 to 44 year old uh, age group in terms of absolute volume, uh, followed uh, by the uh, 5 uh, to 12 year olds. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time today on uh, antigen testing um, and to kind of reflect some of what we've been doing in the antigen testing space um, over um, the last number of months. So we have been doing um, programmes uh, in a number of sectors since the end of July uh, on antigen testing. So just to give you kind of flavour of what's been, what's been going on. So for early years and third level, uh, we've been running an antigen testing programme with over 29 um, sites involved. Some sites have started uh, and completed their journey and others are continuing and some more being uh, added in week on week. Um, with this testing, it's twice weekly testing. People do the test themselves at home. It's a self-test kit and they are um, asked to be asymptomatic. Uh, so if they do have symptoms, obviously they are advised not to go to work and to seek a PCR test. So all of the people who have been involved in this programme have been asymptomatic and testing themselves um, twice a week. Um, we have low numbers of positives coming um, from these um, tests uh, and what was positive in terms of two cases uh, in, that, in that environment have all been confirmed uh, by PCR. Uh, and people then so into our normal contact tracing system. If you then uh, look at the residential care facilities for older persons, we started a programme there over four weeks ago. We picked certain counties in the country. You can see there Galway, Mayo, Roscommon, Wicklow and North Dublin and County. 
what we did there was a slightly different um, because of the setting involved. We asked staff in 162 nursing homes, we asked the nursing homes if they would get involved. Um, around 50 have agreed to be involved in the programme. And what we asked our staff to do was come into work 15 minutes early and to get tested on site, uh, supervised. Again, they test themselves with the self-testing kit, but they are supervised by their nursing uh, management structures. Um, in the last number of weeks, around three and a half thousand staff have done uh, and that and uh, two cases um, have been uh, reported in the same uh, location uh, and confirmed by PCR. What we do know, though, to date is that in all the sites we have been doing antigen testing, and uh, there have been no um, outbreaks in those uh, residential care facilities in that time frame. One of the main goals uh, of that program was there a mixture of operational logistics pilots to see how the tests get used, how people feel about using them, but particularly in the residential care facilities to try to see if we could have an impact on outbreaks, both having an outbreak in general, but also the size of the outbreak. Um, I will talk about some of the learnings overall from those pilots, but one of the learnings very early on was um, trying to gather information manually uh, was very um, slow and cumbersome. So a number of weeks ago in the middle of September, we launched uh, an antigen testing uh, portal. And through this portal, so far we've had over 16,000 uh, results reported. Um, 11,000 of these results have been positive antigen tests. Now, what this means is that members of the public are using antigen testing um, and they are reporting to us that they have received a positive result from that test. So over 11,000 um, have received a positive test result. 64% uh, of them were fully vaccinated uh, when they did that antigen test and were positive. 87% of them were symptomatic. So what they what happens when they report that antigen is they get referred for a PCR test. Uh, and when they were referred, about 80% of them were confirmed on PCR. So this is new data for us over the last um, four weeks and starting to understand a little bit more about how people use antigen tests in Ireland and their, their vaccination status, their age uh, and their general um, uh, location where they're living. Um, we do ask people who are involved in our programmes um, to record um, their negative results. It just helps us understand within the particular programme um, the, the volume of, of negative results as well as the positive. Um, so, as I mentioned, some of the reasons for doing this was to get some feedback uh, on the use of antigen testing. Uh, what we did find was um, we, when we did surveys of the people who were involved, people found them really easy to use, like um, really 10 out of 10 in terms of how easy they were. A uh, general consensus that they're much easier um, than the nasopharyngeal geal swabs, which um, we do with, um, with a PCR. Um, we also found that um, people, I'm losing my slides here now. I like to move on me. Um, we also found that um, there was a, 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 an online system was really important because the manual um, checking of results was, was quite difficult. Um, participation rates did vary um, from one place to the other and we do have some feedback on how to kind of update, uh, increase um, uptake rates. Um, challenges were really uh, admin related um, and the administration burden of actually doing them and trying to also encourage participation. That was something that was really important within some of our programmes. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's challenging to get people to kind of participate. So there's some of the things to consider if people are, are running antigen programmes. So based on the NEFID advice, uh, we are going to introduce um, uh, antigen testing for close contacts. Um, what we're uh, going to do from the end of next week is uh, when people are um, COVID uh, positive, we will continue to gather their close contacts. We will text message close contacts as we currently do to let them know they're a close contact. And we'll follow that by a phone call to ascertain whether or not they have been vaccinated or not and if they're symptomatic. So if they're vaccinated, um, well, they will go into the antigen pathway. If they are unvaccinated, they will go through what they currently do, which is the PCR um, pathway. If you're unvaccinated and uh, are vaccinated, sorry, and you have symptoms, again, you're better to go through the PCR pathway and you'll be advised by the tracer um, to do that. Uh, so for those who are coming through the antigen pathway, um, we will um, gather their uh, details as we normally do, and we will organise to send um, uh, the antigen kits um, straight um, to their home. We will put out guidance through the HSE website, detailed guidance, videos, FAQs, and full details on antigen testing in the coming days. But we did just draft up um, 
a, a pathway to just kind of show you what happens. So from that call three, which is the one that um, tells you you're a close contact, the kit gets sent out to your home. You do get um, reminders from us um, to take the test. You will get a box of five antigen tests and be asked to use three of them. Uh, every second day. So if you this a kit arrives with you on a Monday, you'll be asked to take the test on a Monday, Wednesday, and a Friday. Um, any of those tests, if they're positive, you go straight into our PCR pathway and book yourself a PCR test and immediately self-isolate. If the tests are negative, uh, we will ask you to report the results if you can uh, on our website again to help us with our analysis. But um, you just continue uh, as normal. Vaccinated close contacts who don't have symptoms, don't have to restrict their movements. And we just ask you to take the test three times every second day uh, over a period in all likelihood of a week or so. Uh, we'll give more advice uh, on this through our website uh, next week as we roll this out. Thank you very much. Okay, just going to give a very brief update in relation to the vaccine programme. Slide move coming. Oh, sorry, yes, sir. Sorry, I'm just mixing up my fault. Yeah. So, just in terms of the overall administration of the programme, I suppose the headlines. Um, we're at 93.6% of people who are fully partially vaccinated and 92.4% fully vaccinated. So those figures remain amongst the highest in the EU uh, and are very strong. What we are still doing, we are still running small numbers, 20,000 last week of dose one and dose two from the current programme. And our booster programme is running at around 50,000 in, in a sort of seven day rolling period. What we're also seeing is a slight increase yesterday where we had two and a half thousand new people registered for their first dose, which was really good. Prior to that, we were running at about 1,800 to 1,000 a day. So hopefully perhaps some of the messages that are there around the unvaccinated that Paul, Anne and Neve have also talked about are getting through to people and we'll continue to see some increased movement on that. And I'll talk later about one or two other issues we're going to run over the Halloween period. Just then on our general update, I mean, figures are still really good. As I said, we remain amongst the highest in the EU. Again, the one area we would encourage is parents perhaps just to consider, in light of what's happened over the last two weeks, to consider getting their children vaccinated. That's in that 12 to 17 age group. And that's really important. Our figures in that age group are really high in European terms. But again, we feel that's just another important group to focus on, alongside perhaps right across the spectrum all other ages, if you're unvaccinated, we would encourage you to come forward. And you've seen from the figures in ICU and in hospitals, the impact on individuals who are unvaccinated. Just then on our, our program around immunocompromised, just to clarify, I suppose this isn't a booster. This is a third dose for people whose immune systems need that third dose in order to give them maximum effectiveness. We estimate that's going to be somewhere between 50 and 100,000, probably closer to the top end of that number. These are being identified through our hospital system over recent weeks and currently been referred in for vaccination. So at the moment, you can see there we've already referred 57,000. Over 45,000 appointments have been issued out and 22,000 primary doses have been issued to people. Clearly in this group, A, they're hard to identify and B, people will often be in contact with hospital services and may need to seek new appointments and so on. So we see that process running still for a number of weeks. But again, just to be crystal clear, we are identifying those people. We will contact you. You don't need to contact us and we will make sure that you're contacted through the hospital system. Our booster program then is the program really that's been launched in, in recent weeks and initially is focused on residents in long-term care aged over 65 years of age and people over 80 years of age. Just taking long-term care first, and I want to acknowledge the work that we've been doing with Nursing Home Ireland and all of the other residential services across older persons, mental health disabilities, including our own facilities in the HSE. Really good progress has been made there, and we expect to finish out that programme over the coming week or 10 days. You can see there are 21,843 vaccinations completed. Target group is in the region of about 30,000, and the uptake in nursing homes and in residential care has been really, really good. So again, that's excellent for a group who we know have been vulnerable in the past. 
For over 80s, which have been done through general practice, we're up over 101,000, past that 100,000 mark. And again, there's a population of about 161,000. Last time around, the uptake again was very good. It was over 99% and 97% in terms of some of the ages. So again, re really, really good in terms of uptake. And the GPs are continuing to work through those groups. And again, the feedback from general practice is very positive. The population's response to those over 80s. Our target to complete for that is going to be mid-November. But again, to reinforce, we will have other channels for people who perhaps for a variety of reasons are not able to take the vaccine at the time that they're being offered through general practice, or indeed if they have some concerns or medical conditions or so on, we will make sure they're picked up at a later date. Just then on the booster planning, before I go to our last point then around some of the communications we're going to run over Halloween. So we received the NIAC advice in terms of the 60 to 80 year olds. Uh, what we've been doing with that is working through the planning and that process will finish early next week. We expect that population to be in around 800,000 people. Uh, we will work through the channels that we'll use, you know, the mix of vaccination centres, GPs and so on, pharmacy. The process will be proactive. So we will be offering appointments to people, contacting people to try and encourage them to come forward to get their booster shots. And again, we'll have a lot of information available through the public domain. There's a whole full communications plan that will be launched around that. Uh, and that will be sometime over the coming weeks. So finally, just have two slides. As you know, we've run a lot of initiatives to try and, I suppose, give people the maximum opportunity to get vaccinated and also to give them all of the information that we can to try and encourage them to take that up. So what we're doing over the Halloween period, over the next sort of 10 days effectively, is a Halloween COVID-19 vaccine campaign. The people we want to reach are people who are in hesitant communities. We know where some of those are, and we've been working with some of the advocacy groups in those areas. Women who have concern about pregnancy and fertility, and again, through our Women and Infants program, we're working with people in the hospitals and looking at initiatives that can try and encourage uptake there. People who need easier access to a vaccine site, so perhaps geographical issues or so on, perhaps for some people, and also those with underlying conditions. Paul referred to the high number of people in ICU. We know from our ICU consultants, many of those people in ICU who were unvaccinated had underlying conditions or medical conditions that made them medically vulnerable, such as obesity. So it's really important if you're in those categories, you come forward because we can see the consequences for people. So that's really important. We will share out details from the HSE's perspective of extra walk-in clinics, pharmacies, which will still be active around this, and also facts and advice from various experts around vaccines, pregnancy and fertility to try and encourage those groups to come forward. You will see us on news media, TV and radio, out of home in terms of bus shelters, advertising in areas where we know the uptake, small local electoral areas where we know the uptake has been poor, digital marketing, national press and videos, and really important as well in terms of information in multiple languages to target particular groups where we know there's been some difficulties. So finally, just a sweep of that, there's a broad campaign that's going to cut right across over that period to try and encourage those that have not come forward based on two things that have served us well right through this. One is good information targeted at particular groups as well as broad information for those who are unvaccinated. And secondly, making sure people have good access to the vaccine service. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Damien. Uh, now we take some questions. If you could identify your name and media organisation, please. Thanks, Fergal. Uh, Fergal Barrows, RTE News. Um, I suppose th the first question I have is, um, as of now, to what extent are planned procedures, uh, are many planned procedures cancelled due to COVID-19 pressures? I mean, are the current cancellations extensive or are they relatively small numbers at this point? And then also, how soon might you see large scale cancellations if the pressures really grow as they might? So the cancellations at the minute have been done on a side by side basis. We haven't issued a national directive around cancellation as had happened previously in COVID surges. Uh, but there are a number of sites now that are curtailing scheduled care. Um, so when you look at the South and CUH, you look at Galway, uh, Limerick pulled back, um, they're, you know, they are under significant pressure because there's a, only a certain amount of capacity in any hospital, be it theatre capacity or anything, uh, diagnostic capacity, etc. So they are now curtailing um, in line with their unscheduled care demands. But at the minute, those decisions are being made on a day by day basis. So the sites, the clinical leads and the sites are determining whether they can bring people in. We know that uh, in the south, there, there's very little. So really, it is time dependent, critical work only. 
Um, and that is, I suppose, we are working with the private hospitals in that regard. So we are back to that in terms of trying to source capacity wherever we can. Uh, the reality is that the surge that we are experiencing, so it is COVID related, but also non-COVID, uh, we just have a very significant number of people coming through uh, the doors into our emergency departments. And at the minute, you know, we are conducting an audit in Galway to see exactly who all of these people are and why are they coming in, uh, just to really get an understanding of what pathway maybe isn't there uh, that would support these people. Um, so it is still, so yes, they are being curtailed. We will continue to review it. Uh, the reality is in our big model four sites, the activity is driven by the emergency department. And as long as that is the case, we have to juggle that. We don't want to scale back. We're acutely aware of the um, as the scaling bath that we've already done. Um, and we really want to keep uh, carrying out these procedures uh, wherever we can. Colin Pines, just prior to, or just before we seen the recent surge in cases, we had just activated a short-term action plan between now and the end of December, focused on trying to, as Anne had explained earlier on, uh, stop the increase in the uh, waiting list, particularly the outpatient waiting list, which has had some success as we've shown there. And that involves utilising theatre capacity out of hours uh, and at weekends for public hospitals, extra capacity in the private system, as Anne's outlined, about 1,100 days per week, and, and also new pathways of care for people to get possibly their outpatient department outside of the uh, hospital system. So those actions are triggered and are working, uh, but ultimately the surge that's coming through the uh, ED and COVID puts pressure on that. But it has, and it's still in place, it's about 100 million uh, investment between now and the year end. And we want to try to keep that going, but Anne said, site by site, and make calls. And it's worth noting the private hospitals are busy too, so they're not, you know. Probably would have been a question for Colm Henry, but he's not here at the moment. So I'm, Damien, I'm not sure you can answer this, but um, is there any evidence to suggest that boosters are are particularly needed for the um, 60 to 70 age group because they got the AstraZeneca uh, jabs? I mean, while all of the COVID vaccines are effective, some perhaps you know slightly better than others, but would that partially explain what's going on over in Britain at the moment where they've been heavily dependent on AstraZeneca and that's where the boosters are needed actually for that age group. Any it's, evidence on that? Yeah, I mean, I won't get into the medical sphere as you'll appreciate, Fergal, but uh, NIAC obviously gave us the advice, we just got it this week in terms of the 60 to 80 year olds and they would have evaluated all of that as part of the consideration. Now, they'll publish the evidence behind that. That isn't, we haven't got that yet in detail in terms that would probably answer some of your questions. Our understanding is, though, that there is still good immunity in terms of AstraZeneca as well. In fact, so I don't think, my understanding is at the moment, there isn't that difference between the vaccines, but ultimately NIAC will publish their evidence and that will, I suppose, tell us in terms of what, what guided them to use that age group from 60 to 80. And, I, and then my, my last question for now is really for, for you, Damien. You know, I, you, I hear about your campaign that you're going to run uh, for Halloween. Um, um, but there is that body of what of 350,000 or 370,000 or so there aren't people who aren't fully vaccinated. I mean, has there been a notable increase in people coming forward now who up to now hadn't opted uh, uh, for vaccination? I mean, what figure would you put on the numbers that have come forward since, I suppose if you could put it, there's been a particular um, push and urge for those to you know, consider opting and getting vaccinated? I suppose what we've continued to see, if you take the last 14 days, we look in a rolling period, we're continuing to see over a thousand, in around a thousand people a day. And as I said yesterday, whether it was caused by the focus on the recent changes and so on, but we had two and a half thousand new people registered. Uh, what I would say is that that number, we, we've broken that out as best we can to segment it, to understand it. And our campaign, if you like, is focused on those groups, whether it's difficult to reach groups, perhaps people who are working in certain industry sectors, we had the third level campaign, which was very successful, took another three and a half thousand young students in who were vaccinated, previously unvaccinated. The walk-in clinics in general have a range of people across all ages, but typically are concentrated in the middle ages, that sort of 20 to 40 age group. But right across the spectrum, we have people of 80 years of age still coming forward to be vaccinated. So I suppose what we would say is when you look at the impact in terms of ICU, there's a particular focus there on people who are medically vulnerable. It's really important if you are medically vulnerable, mentioned some of the conditions that are there before it's really important those people come forward also we're working with general practice there because in some cases at this point if they haven't come forward they may need some reassurance from a practitioner uh, and gps are working with us on that as indeed are pharmacies and we have lists of pharmacies on our websites that are there we've also running targeted campaigns in particular geographical areas right down to local electorate areas which are small parts of the country 
where we were been able to analyze with the CSO and see perhaps that there's a slight variation in the uptake from the norms. Now, all of that is set in the context where we have the highest uptake rates in Europe, the highest uptake rates in, in terms of even younger people as well. Uh, so like that's the context for it, but we're continuing, I suppose, to try and probe and see, can we get more people to come forward in light of the pressures that we're seeing coming into our hospital system? Uh, Paul Quinn, Virgin Media News. Uh, your grand. Paul, can I just ask you, um, the Tornish that mentioned some figures during the week about where he thinks things might peak in hospitals and ICU uh, in the coming weeks. How bad is the situation in your view? Where do you think would peak and what will those figures be like? And maybe on that, many people will be watching and and saying, well, we, we went out, we got our vaccine, we're doing our best, we're at the highest in Europe. And when they hear now again about surge capacities and us having to protect the health system, they just don't know what more they can do. What would your message be to people? Yeah, I think our message to the public today particularly is twofold. Uh, for those who are vaccinated and fully vaccinated, they are at higher levels of protection. And that's particularly what we're seeing in terms of who comes through to hospital or indeed who comes through to ICU. So our particular call to that population is just reboot, you know, refocus on the basic public health measures. There's more of us going indoors at the moment. There's more of us socially mixing at the moment. There's more of us back at work at the moment. So it's it's a basic, and it's, indeed it's to enterprise and business. As people are back in work, create the environment and make sure the environment is there for social distancing. You know, not too many people in meeting rooms again. It worked when we were online as people are come back and we're encouraging people to be back on a phase basis. So the call to those people who are vaccinated is, is really just manage some of the basics and continue to do it. They have done what we've asked, which has come forward for vaccination. For those who aren't vaccinated, as Damien has said, you have to break that number up into its various components, but there is a specific and uniform message to all of those. You are at higher levels of risk. You're putting your family at higher level of risk. You're putting your friends and you're putting the wider society at higher levels of risk. And there is an issue about the common good. And I would be saying, come forward. Let's address your concerns. Let's address your, uh, your questions. Uh, but getting vaccinated is an absolute priority to help us uh, protect the transmission levels as well at the moment. So two different, distinct, very, mess very clear messages, I hope. And just how far you see the situation going in the next couple of weeks and, and figures or where you think this might peak? Yeah, well, all indications are and all the evidence are that this will deteriorate in terms of hospitalizations and ICU in the coming weeks. That's the NEFID, NEFID modeling. It's what we expect and the lag effect that we're all well used to. Uh, you know, when you're seeing over 2,000 cases a day, it won't be to the same level of numbers of admissions we don't expect what we would have seen in January and February when we got to 2,000 uh, people in hospital and 220 people in ICU. But there will be a lag effect, which will create more people sicker and going into hospital over the next two weeks. And equally, a further lag effect for many of those people. So we see on a time frame basis, modeling out, this will continue up to the end of November. Uh, where we would hope you start to see it reach its peak and decline. You know, but layer on top of that, what we just outlined today, all of the other respiratory illnesses that are out there, and you get that level of confusion and coming forward for various, uh, yeah, various illnesses coming to us. So we see COVID uh, continuing to rise, hospitalizations continue to rise, ICU continuing to rise uh, throughout November. And Neve, can I just ask you, um, before you manage to escape out the door tomorrow, um, you mentioned about community testing somewhere, I think, 11.8%, um, but in some counties, 19%. What are the counties where we're seeing the highest level of community transmission and what do you think that's down to and what in general are we seeing? Uh, is it just the increased social activities and gatherings like we've, you know, we've, we've seen throughout the pandemic? Uh, so counties with the highest, and um, Kerry stands um, uh, alone uh, at 19% in terms of its uh, positivity. Uh, other counties down the south, uh, Waterford uh, is also quite high on community testing, 17-18%. Um, um, Carlo, um, Longford, uh, and, and then generally in the northeast, um, is our, the cases are, are rising in those counties. Um, I think overall, I mean, contact tracing, um, when they're talking to people, they are finding people are a little older than they were They were previously um, more unwell. Um, we do have people, uh, over 87% of people who are talking to are symptomatic uh, now when they are COVID positive and uh, some of them quite uh, unwell on the phone. Um, 
we are also finding generally, yes, social mixing. So pe more people, while the overall number of close contacts hasn't moved, um, it kind of is staying in around three, three and a half. What we are finding is that there are larger groups of close contacts at, at certain events and there are more people with more than five close contacts than there would previously have been. So the average still blends out the same, but there are still more pockets, as you would expect, because society is open and, and vaccinated people are meeting together. So um, we are definitely finding that there's more and bigger groups in social settings at home and outside. Just ask you as well briefly about the situation in schools, because I think new figures from the HSBC today show that there have been more outbreaks uh, in workplaces and in schools. What is the situation there? So um, overall, the cases are up. So in the last week alone, it's every age group and the cases have risen. And um, the prior week, the only age group that was declining was the 13 to 18. So now it's, it's all age groups. And the two uh, with the highest volume are 35 to 44 year olds and the and children. So like the number one message to parents and families is to get vaccinated to help protect um, children who are not able to be vaccinated. And um, so parents getting vaccinated is really important. And then not going to school uh, with symptoms um, of COVID-19 and maintaining uh, the rest of the infection prevention and control procedures, they remain uh, really important. We have uh, we don't have any plans to reintroduce um, our tracing. Um, our public health teams are, are comfortable uh, and feel it is appropriate the way we are currently um, managing the cases of children and really important that children stay in school. Shauna Bowers with the Irish Examiner. Just following on from Fergal's first question there, um, at what point do you think you might need to issue a national directive to defer care? Like, is that a concern before Christmas when you combine all the other winter pressures on the health service? We're not looking at that at the minute. Uh, so we will do everything we can to not do that. Uh, and it was an extreme situation last year in light of the COVID surge. Uh, I think we'll have to watch and see what happens over the coming weeks at the minute. You know, our services are, as I said, very, very busy and they are very challenged, but they are working. Um, and I think, you know, we, are, we wouldn't want to do that because that will be a stop of everything. Uh, and there are geographical variations here. So we are looking at certain sites being under significant pressure and they are making those decisions and we are supporting them uh, in terms of dealing with the demand day by day and week by week. Oh, there never has to any way been a single number that we get to on the you know, triggers and action. It's going to be informed by two perspectives. One, the level of sickness that we're seeing coming through. And we do, we are in a better place. People are much higher protected because of vaccination. So there's not a single number. And exactly as Anne said, we take it to feedback from the system in terms of where they make the calls. But I would say to everybody, this can be turned around. And I know people are sick of us saying with this, but the combination of all our measures, whether it's in the workplace, whether it's at home, or when we're socially mixing, just getting back to some of the basics can actually turn this around, particularly specifically because we're vast majority of us are vaccinated now. We're in a much better place, but we have to go back to some of the basics of public health measures. You mentioned that there's immense pressure on the paediatric units uh, with regard to RSV. Could you tell me a little bit more about that? Do we have figures for the increase in presentations with that? Uh, we do. I don't have the mummy, I don't think, but I know talking to um, Children's Health Ireland even just today, uh, their attendances are significantly higher, they would say, than even 2019. Um, and they are experiencing very significant pressures in Crumlin and in Temple Street in terms of their attendances. Um, they, are, they are managing it. But there are, so for example, today, there are no pediatric ICU beds available. Um, they are dealing with, uh, I suppose, a significant range of pressures and RSV is a key thing. Now, RSV comes often. We didn't really get it last year because people weren't mixing as much, but it would be a common theme. But I think, again, what is different for us this year is the cumulative impact of COVID with the other things coming back. So people this year will have some of these infections that are not COVID that they probably didn't get last year by virtue of just not, not mixing as much. Uh, so it is all of that is the mix of everything that is causing the huge pressure. Uh, and they are, seeing, um, they are seeing high attendances. We have seen trolleys in the children's services, which we would not want. Um, but certainly in the last couple of weeks, that has been a feature as well, given the pressures. Just one more question for me, uh, for you, Neve. On you, you mentioned that it kind of varies um, geographically in terms of community positivity rates. Are there particular areas that are particularly problematic at the minute? 
Uh, yes, yeah, so some of the counties um, down the south of the country would be higher um, than the overall average. So the average for community testing is around 11.8. And some of the outliers would be up at 19% and 16, 17%, mostly um, down the south of the country uh, between Kerry, uh, Waterford, um, Carlow, Longford, also, and then further up uh, north in the northeast. Yes, and then. Uh, Paul O'Donoghue from News Talk. Um, perhaps one for yourself, uh, Paul. Just like that, we're kind of talking about, you know, return to basic measures and NEFIT were kind of making similar comments as well yesterday. So just to quantify it for people a bit, I suppose, or make it a bit more concrete. So what exactly is it we're talking about? Hand washing, mask wearing, social, like what exactly are you looking for people to do? Yeah, no, thanks, Paul. I think the reality of it is, thankfully, we're all getting back to the opening of society, being able to go out, socialise for a meal, go to a bar, nightclubs now opening up as well. I think that's a very positive thing for all of us, particularly with high vaccination rates. But as we are doing that, uh, yes, I would make the case. Uh, and as we're in work, keeping the social distancing. So if we're at workplace at work, make sure you have that social distance space between you. Uh, make sure if you're at meetings, people are wearing masks. Make sure there's plenty of hand cleanser uh, around the location of work or indeed at home. Uh, and again, in terms of enterprise, making sure that hand cleanser is still available uh, and filled up on a regular basis for retail units. Um, the, the very clear call that went out to uh, the service industry this week uh, to ensure that they are implementing uh, the public health measures and the public health checks and the COVID cert that goes with it. But I will be saying to the public, it's the basic ones of keeping more distance, hand washing, wearing a mask appropriately, uh, and particularly as we're at work bases or in social gatherings. Um, and I suppose like that, if you think people do that, like, will that be enough to, I suppose, stem the surge in cases that we've been seeing? Yeah, I think, I think it'll make a very real impact, the combined effort of what it is. And look, the reality of us, I think we can all put hands on heart and saying as we you know, seeing things improve, the high levels of vaccination rates, we were socially mixing more, we were back indoors, uh, we were in the bar, we were having meals. Uh, it, it felt like normal again, which is good for everybody. But we need to keep that normality with some of the basic measures. Just like that, there's been like a focus on the unvaccinated and you're, you're kind of targeting them yourself as well, obviously. Um, is it not the case that there is always going to be a small percentage of people who are unvaccinated um, and, and like that? I, I, I mean, will it really make that much of a difference, I suppose, um, say, if the number of people who are unvaccinated goes from 10 percent to 8 percent or so? That's a good question. And look, we, you know, I wouldn't use the phrase that we're targeting them, but we're certainly very focused to increase every person that we can to get them vaccinated. Uh, certainly, as Damien has stressed very clearly, the uptake here is really good. What is disproportionate are hospitalizations and particularly ICU of people not vaccinated. So if we can, every percentage that we get from those remaining uh, elements of the population, if that can bring back those levels of people um, who are not vaccinated in ICU, it's really that important. So you know, yes, it is that we keep doing it, keep working through those groups, break up that 8% into its various components and as Damien had said, uh, a very focused communications campaign uh, to those people. It will make a difference. Yeah, Paul Cullen from the Irish Times. Just to be clear, um, you've got the NEFIT models or forecasts for the end of November. Hopefully, that seems to like maybe even a best case scenario, but it seems likely that that's what we're going to have. Are your hospitals and your, your senior staff telling you you can cope with this level of hospitalizations in ICU? Or are they looking for additional measures or funding uh, in order to be able to, 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 to cope? Yeah, and there's two parts of the answer, Paul, to, to your question. As we're heading into winter, we know we have to support the hospital system on a normal basis around enhanced uh, investment and number of measures. And we do have the funding for that and we're just fin finalising the details of that. So we know, and the hospital system knows, they need extra supports through winter, specifically related to COVID uh, and those numbers that were laid yesterday. As you said, 
they're not um, you know they're not out of this world in terms of what might happen so you know getting to 150 people in ICU or a thousand people admitted certainly in January we had over 2,000 people in hospital and over 220 people in ICU but what happened in January we had to cease all other COVID care so what our hospital system are very clearly saying to us and our consultants nobody wants to go back to a situation where we collapse all known COVID care care to cope with those numbers and that's the real call that we hear people really want to get back they're seeing people's delayed care and uh, neglected uh, for a long period of time uh, they're seeing the impacts of that they're equally conscious of non-COVID uh, treatments required as COVID so you know we would cope with numbers what impacts them on, on other aspects of healthcare. And, and maybe can I just, uh, just add to that just now, Paul, in terms of sometimes the pressures are not just in the hospital so a very real challenge that we have uh, relates to home support. We are very challenged in getting home support workers in a number of parts of the country now and that is not a funding issue. There is plenty of funding for home support. We cannot get carers. Uh, if you take the southeast, they are currently running their fourth recruitment campaign for carers. Uh, they can't get them in either the HSE services or uh, the contracted services. So this is a real issue that we have uh, currently and home support has a very big impact on our ability to keep people out of hospital or to take them out when they've been admitted. Um, and that actually is a very real concern. So when you look at the whole health system, uh, the numbers are, you know, there are different challenges in different areas. Just to be clear, can you, can you, can you accommodate those numbers, predicted numbers, without widespread postponement or cancellation of elective and other work? If we can get near levels of 150 people with, IC, sorry, with COVID in our ICU, which is half our capacity, that most definitely impacts uh, and and is today even at 88 impacting on elective care already yeah. Yeah. Um, can i just ask probably damien um in relation to vaccination who are the hesitant communities who are non -vac not we would have some evidence say in relation to certain communities that we've worked with such as the roma community uh, other communities which are from other nationalities who are working in particular industry sectors so uh, in the food sector and we've been working with that at a sector level, I suppose, in trying to offer up alternatives, uh, pathways for people, but also in terms of language, uh, also in terms of maybe having medical people who speak those languages to try and talk to those people to help assist them to, to convince them. Um, and we've also looked at areas such as, for example, in the traveling community. So there's a wide range of areas within that. They're not in themselves huge numbers, but they're very important in relation to trying to, I suppose, because if they're living together, perhaps in, in large numbers, and then if COVID comes in, then the problem is that that will then cause widespread outbreaks within those communities. A lot of outbreaks in traveller groups in, in, among the uh, There has been through, through through the whole, um, you know, COVID pandemic, we have had outbreaks in traveller communities. But recently there have been at least... Uh, well, I think there's... The other groups. Yeah, there still continues to be outbreaks in many of those communities. But I suppose what we would say is that um, we have made some inroads in some of those areas through working with groups, and particularly with advocacy groups around those groups. Um, and we'll continue to try and do that over the next couple of weeks to see whether we can, you know, bring more people through the vaccination program and get the, get those people fully vaccinated. The talk of the 300,000 people or whatever it is who are not vaccinated and 70,000 people who've only got one dose, it, it, it's, it's probably quite a disparate group. I mean, the HSE wasn't able to tell me how many people couldn't get vaccinated for health reasons. I've had people onto me who can't get a second dose for various health reasons, can't get a clear answer from the HSE about what they should do. I suppose it's a clinical call really, but it is quite a disparate group and, and perhaps if your messaging was a bit more targeted rather than sort of grouping everybody all together, it might be, you might have a better success rate. Yeah, there's a couple of points on that. Uh, I suppose the first thing is, yes, if individuals who clinically can't get that, that's a clinical discussion with their own clinician. What we are doing, people who've registered and who haven't actually taken up their first dose, they're all going to be contacted individually. People who've taken their first dose and haven't got their second dose will also be contacted to try and understand those reasons and quantify that. Uh, and there'll be other factors there. There would be people perhaps on the system who've traveled abroad, who've moved abroad, who've deceased. There's a whole range of other factors as to why that will happen. They'll never exactly match up. I suppose while we've run universal campaigns throughout the vaccination program, we have been working with groups in the background. I think what we're trying to do here is pull this under the umbrella as we hit the end of the current phase and move to the booster phase of trying to have those individual campaigns, but under the overall umbrella, I suppose, given that this week people are aware of the increased pressure on hospitals, the impact in terms of ICU, but also on themselves. You know, we've seen, as I mentioned, in terms of ICU, people who are medically vulnerable 
uh, are making up a large number of that 60% that, that Paul and Anne referred to in ICU. So they're a particular group that we've got to focus with. And again, we have, for example, representative bodies that look after cancer, kidney, and so on. We work with those groups to get the messages out to those people as best we can. But I think at this stage, what we would recognize for some groups, it's going to take a different type of intervention. So for example, we are encouraging some of the clinicians as well to engage the people, to engage with their own clinician, to have that discussion that perhaps may help them to change their mind to take the vaccine. And that's just one example of, of the sort of initiatives that we're running over the next week or 10 days. The campaigns are not always above the line where the wider public will see them. So some of the uh, NGO uh, groups that would work with us on vulnerable groups, uh, the immigration office who would work with us in terms of people coming in and promoting uh, uptake. Uh, and as Damien said, some um, industry specific sectors, specifically meat plants uh, that we're working with, public health teams are going in and communicating in there within the meat plants uh, to teams there. So you may not always see it above the line, but you are correct. It's not one homogenous group. That we're trying to reach. One of the things that uh, people, experts say in various kind of health issues, say drug issues or something, is taking services where they're needed rather than, you know, where you might be based. And just in relation to that, having, having had to make a 20 mile journey to get my daughter's HPV vaccine during the week because they're not doing it in school, I'm just wondering about the 12 to 15 year olds. Have you tried to get access to the schools to do some of that work in the schools? Because they seem to be closed to everybody. Uh, and it's going to have ruinous consequences for the other vaccines, the, 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 the HB and other kids' vaccines. But is there any way to, to, you know, to get in there to schools to deliver vaccines to, to the uh, t 20 and 40 percent of those younger age groups who haven't? I suppose vaccinated? there is a difference between the HB va vaccine, the nature of the flu vaccine as well, say, and the COVID vaccine in terms of how they're handled and the whole arrangements around it. Uh, what I would say, though, is the way we've tried to use them, Paul, is pharmacy because they're very local. So, you know, we've had a wide range of pharmacies in general practice as well are still offering that vaccine to people. Um, but the pharmacy sector has been invaluable. They've done over 300,000 vaccinations uh, and they're geographically all throughout the country. So if I take the example I gave earlier of some of the local electoral areas where we know the uptake has been below what we would have hoped for, um, then the pharmacy sector have been really important there. Say like the border community, we've run campaigns in Monaghan and Donegal to try and promote access. Huge geographical counties where people, as you say, might have to travel distance, and it may be a deterrent for some people. And hence that opens up the access beyond, say, for example, as you say, vaccine centres. Um, so I think we've, we've opened up that access right through the programme. And then what we've tried to do is encourage people perhaps in terms of access. But also I think it has to be at this stage backed up with other information as well that might have perhaps persuade people and see the benefit for them individually, for their family, and then for the wider sort of societal benefit as well. Uh, Grania from the journal.ie. Um, I might start with the, the numbers of people in hospitals and ICUs. Are there co comorbidities or common risk factors across the groups that are in hospitals and ICUs um, that, that, that the HC has noticed? In ICU, particular problems of immunocompromised, I think as general as uh, Damien said earlier on. And hospitalizations, no, we're seeing across all the ages, I think I gave you the breakdown of the ages, but no specific comorbidity. Com no, comorbidity. So there's all sorts of underlying conditions that people have mm. um, that would impact on, as Paul said, it could be immunocompromised or just very ill um, for all sorts of reasons. Uh, so, you know, with, with an ICU, we have people uh, who are admitted post, um, you know, trauma uh, or serious illnesses, post serious surgeries, etc. Um, the important thing to note around our ICU capacity, though, too, is that we can't book certain procedures unless we know we have ICU beds available because we know certain procedures people will need to go straight to ICU. Uh, but no, I mean, there's a whole range of conditions and reasons why people are in ICU or why people become ill. And we haven't seen certainly our feedback from the system is not that we've seen any shift or change in terms of what they would have seen coming through, uh, you know, pre-vaccination and post-vaccination, it's still across age groups. Um, would the HSE like to see booster shots for healthcare workers? Yes, I mean, it's a particular cause of concern for myself, obviously, running the CEO of the HSE and all of us. Um, you know, our healthcare workers, concern being if it's highly transmissible in the community, you know, it can ultimately get into our healthcare workers, but also within the healthcare settings. So yes, I'd like to see it. I'm not the expert in terms of the evidence. Uh, the National Immunisation Advisory Committee are, and in fairness to them, I think one of the high, one of the reasons we have the 
high levels of uptake is I think the public have listened and understood that this assessment is being made by qualified people. But I'm just saying I'm willing to hate to say and I would have concern for our healthcare workers. Number of cases, cases, COVID cases acquired in hospital at the moment. Yeah, we've seen it. We've seen an increase in it. I mean, if you look back to the worst of January, we're seeing uh, up to 500 cases uh, of you know in a two-week period. Uh, we're seeing nothing like that right now. There has been just over 100 cases in a two-week period of hospital acquired uh, COVID. So that does give us cause of concern too, uh, and and in some places a number of positive cases related to that. So yeah, that would be a concern of breakthrough. Yeah, from our perspective. Well, we'll also be very concerned that we have sufficient staff so that the real risk about our healthcare workers is if they can't work uh, and we're heading into a busy period. So as I said, we already have over 1,800 out on COVID leave. Uh, we need all of our staff to be able to work. Um, can I ask about the maternity strict restrictions that have been, the new guidance that has been um, administered or uh, has been sent out today, this afternoon. What obligations are hospital managers under now to enforce those restrictions? Uh, it's a very clear policy direction uh, to the services. Uh, I would say they have worked with us uh, on our National Women's and Infants Programme over the past few days in particular, in relation to the experience that has happened in the National Maternity Hospital and the Rotunda as they reduced the restrictions in the period of eight to eight. Should say that goes along with all of the other um, facilitated partner uh, visits that we put in place. Um, I'll, I'll always qualify this. We do have to manage that risk. You saw, or you heard some of the figures I may have related in relation to pregnant women ending up in ICU, which is a risk we have to manage. Uh, and the fact that we still have a relatively lower uptake uh, from pregnant women of the vaccine. And they're all risk factors. Um, but specifically to your question, we would expect now, and we will be doing site visits, and we are we are getting regular weekly reports uh, from the services from those 19 maternity hospitals. This kind of guidance has been issued before, and the problem has still gone on. Though, you know, is this just another one of those incidences where hospitals are told to let people in a little bit more than they have before, and there's still problems then? Yeah, it went. It has gone on. It's been very frustrating uh, for everybody. For for young um, mums and, and their partners and um, pregnant women but I think what we got to a stage was where there are exceptions or where a hospital has an exception why they can't implement the directive for the policy uh, that they would publish that and we would publish it online so everybody's very clear uh, what the issue they're trying to manage at that particular point I think we also implemented site visits to assess it and we're seeing a reasonably good level of compliance uh, with it so it has been frustrating I think we're in a much better place now uh, in terms of the circulation that's been given out and the engagement with the hospitals on that process with us. But we would be expecting them to, we're expecting them to comply with the process we've circulated. Can I ask a few quick questions about the flu vaccine? What's the uptake rate for that? And do you have any age breakdown? Uh, way too early to say. Yeah. So uh, it only started in October. We wouldn't have uptake rates yet. Um, we are starting, uh, we've started it, GPs have started. Uh, and we have our peer-to-peer -peer vaccinators uh, working, but we don't have any figures in terms of uptake just yet. And it's just one case? Flu flu Only one case so far, yeah, from the, the week. Now, I don't have, that's the week of the, end of the, uh, the 10th of October. I don't have the date from the 17th yet. Um, can we be, can it be explained what the symptoms of having the flu are uh, and ha that are distinct from COVID maybe, be particularly when for people who are vaccinated where the symptoms might be? Uh, no, I think that unfortunately, you know, people can present with similar symptoms and we're certainly seeing, I think, in terms even of the, the testing rates, you know, uh, if people start with respiratory symptoms, likewise, people attending our emergency departments where there's respiratory symptoms, we have to assume uh, that they could be COVID positive until they're considered not to be. Um, but no, I mean, I think that certainly uh, symptoms would be similar. Some of the GPs on, you know, on radio this morning. And it's what we're hearing from GP practice that um, people come forward with symptoms they, they can't distinguish, uh, they're concerned, they're coming forward for testing. The GP has to obviously put people forward for testing as well. So our, our, our GPs are getting extremely busy with people with various symptoms and concerns around COVID. Um, and it is, it is the reason why we always encourage people to seek a consultation, uh, you know, or if you do want to go online and seek a test specifically of COVID, but it may not be COVID, could be something else. And important to say that you can have 
both vaccines. Uh, some people are very anxious about having a flu vaccine. If they're getting a COVID vaccine, you can have both and one doesn't cover you for the other. So uh, it is important that people who are in those categories uh, who are promoting the flu vaccine should get it. Uh, and we have three different types of vaccines. So we have the uh, adult ones. We have the ones also for children now in terms of the nasal spray. So we're also encouraging children to take up the flu vaccine this year. Okay, is there anybody else? Paul, yeah. Quick one. Um, I, I wasn't sure I heard you right on, but you said over 1,800 staff are out. Am I, am I right? If you're vaccinated staff you, uh, and you're a close contact, you're okay. You don't have to... If you're asymptomatic. So, okay, but so that seems like a very high number. Just remind me how it compares to... Obviously, oh, it was higher in we January and February, but it seems... It's lots of... We would we have had, with about 7,000 out. We don't know. Mm. Yeah. But, and some of that could be long-term out in terms of... Asking, many of those are out for longer than six months? I don't, I, I don't know, to be honest. No. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, anybody else? Okay, well, um, thank you all very much. Um, we haven't decided yet to revert to weekly briefings here, but we will have briefings from time to time as needed um, arises, and we'll give you plenty of notice when that's happening. Thank you. Okay.